Welcome. I'm Callie Crossley, host of the radio program Under the Radar with Callie Crossley, host of the TV program Basic Black, a panelist on Beat the Press, and a commentator for GBH's Morning Edition. Thank you for joining us for the fifth edition of our monthly Beyond the Page book club. Today I'm joined by Elise Hooper, author of the historical novel Fast Girls. Special recognition to Trident Booksellers and Cafe, who partnered with the Beyond the Book Club on with the Beyond the Page Book Club on this event. Trident is open for curbside pickup and limited capacity in-store browsing. Visit them in-store 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week or on their website 24-7. Now, before we get started, I want to explain how this will work. Some of you may be new to Zoom. You won't see yourself on video, and you will not be able to speak during the author interview. But we want to hear from you. So you can ask questions by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen um, and put in your question. You can put in your questions at any point in time during my interview with Elise, and I'll include them after our discussion. We encourage you to ask anything about the content of the book or Elise's writing process. And if you should see a question that you really want to hear the answer to, vote for it by clicking thumbs up and move it to the top of the list and we'll do our best to ask the most popular questions. One more thing, throughout the event, we'll be using the poll feature, asking you questions. Let's do a test poll right now. As you'll see, the poll will pop up in the center of your screen. You'll be able to move this window, close this window, or answer the question. And once you answer the question, the window will disappear entirely. Here is our first poll question. Is this your first Beyond the Page book club event? Hmm, 43% say yes, and I'm so excited, great. 45%, even more, been to a few of them. And five, oh no, 6% of you have been to all of them. Okay, keep it up, we like that, that's great. So it's my pleasure to introduce Elise Hooper. Elise is a native New Englander who spent several years writing for television and online news outlets before getting an MA and teaching high school literature and history. She now lives in Seattle with her husband and two daughters. Fast Girls is her third historical novel. The other two are Learning to See and the other Alka. Hi, Elise. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's, I'm delighted. The book is excellent. It's the reason Thank the you. In the second line of the title is a novel of the 1936 women's Olympic team. But you start uh, the stories of these women, your main characters, well before that, so we get to know them. Uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about those three main characters. Well, they. I'm often asked why I really just I went with three instead of one main character, but I just kept discovering fascinating stories from this Olympics. And I felt that these three really give us a very different, three very different paths into the Olympics. We have number one, Betty Robinson, who was, I should also tell people that these are all characters based on real women. Um, so Betty Robinson is inspired by the Betty, real Betty Robinson. She was discovered as a 16 year old schoolgirl in Chicago running for the train one day. And I think this really speaks to the power of educators. One of her teachers spotted her and encouraged her a few days later to um, do a time trial. And she did a local race then shortly after that. And, and only about five races later, she is in Amsterdam in 1928 which is the first year women are allowed to compete in track and field. And she is there representing the United States as this 16 year old woman. So amazing. And then we have Louise Stokes, who was a young woman out of Malden, Massachusetts. So where all of many probably of you are. She uh, was a black girl who had worked her way up through, through the New England racing circuit for years. Whenever Louise could walk, she ran instead. She loved to run. And she will end up being one of the first two black women to qualify for the 1932 Olympic team. Um, and, and then we'll see her again in 36. And then Helen Stevens um, was from Fulton, Missouri. She was known as the Fulton Flash. And she was a farm girl who grew up in a really rural area. 
as a real outcast. She was six feet tall. She ends up with size 12 feet, a birthmark over one eye, a very husky voice. She was a tomboy and not at all interested in um, following the path that most of the other girls in her area were interested in pursuing. So Helen really has a huge transformation over the course of this novel. So three women all with different sets of obstacles that they had to overcome to all come together to race in these 36 games. Something else they had to overcome were just the times and the mores about young women and what they should be doing and what they're capable of doing. I mean, I had to be remind myself over and over again um, throughout your book about, whoa, you know, how many limitations were placed on uh, women of all kinds, but certainly young women uh, during that time. Talk a little bit about that and about that what they chose to do was really quite radical um, in that moment. It was. I had no idea, for example, that Illinois had um, actually made it illegal for girls to participate in high school sports in about 1907. So Betty Robinson there in Chicago is, is actually really setting a whole new, um, she's creating, she's overturning old laws. I had no idea that in the 30s and 40s and, and even a little beyond, people worried that your uterus could fall out if you ran quickly, that perhaps you would grow a mustache or, or beard if you trained hard. Um, there were all these physical concerns about women. Fertility was a big one. And many of these Olympians later went on to sort of point to their large families uh, with a great deal of glee of like, that was not a concern. Um, and then there was just, running was considered fairly blue collar and, and really low class. Uh, when women were allowed in the Olympics fairly early on, I mean, the first modern Olympics is in 1896, and a handful of women are allowed to compete in 1900. These were all in sports that were considered sort of aesthetically pleasing and, and upper class, sailing, tennis, we have sort of archery and fencing coming in and out of the year. So, so the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, really resisted women running for a very long time. They just, no one wanted to see tired looking women. So one of the things that comes through so well in your book is that you've managed to capture the excitement and both the commitment and dedication these women had to running and what it meant for them to be an athlete, even if they weren't thinking of themselves in those terms initially. First of all, my question is, are you an athlete? Do you run? I do. I do. Um, I grew up running. In fact, I grew up outside of Boston and watched the Boston Marathon for many years, watched Joan Benoit win. I mean, that was something I, I've always loved running. I play tennis still. I swim. I do as much as I can. So, so this was a story that felt very near and dear to my heart. It was a world I understood. And, and to be honest, it also just taught me how much over the years I have taken for granted. Um, yeah. You know, just going out for a run and not being heckled. Or, uh, those are things I can do that many of us do these days and, and without ever thinking really twice about it. So, so I learned a lot while working on this book. So that explains to me then why you're able to give me, a person who does not run, the sense of, of what it feels to be on that track. And with that, I'd like you to read an excerpt. Um, and this is uh, about Betty. And okay. you can set the context. Sure. So this is uh, at the 1928 Olympics. And it happens uh, within the first few pages of the book. So no spoilers here. And so this is a description of Betty as she's getting ready for this, this final heat of the 1928 Olympics in the 100 meter. She had made it. This was the Olympics. With these realizations, her shoulders loosened away from her ears. What did she have to lose? A flush of glee filled her. She need to, needed to run like she was trying to catch the train. That was all. One of the officials gestured for the girls to get ready. Each racer stood in her lane above her starting divots. On your marks, said the official in a thick French accent. The next few minutes were a confusing blur of false starts and the elimination of two racers. But through it all, Betty gazed straight ahead to where the finish line lay, determined not to get distracted. She felt ready to spring, her mind clear, her body loose. Out of the corner of her eye, she watched the starting official raise the gun into the air. Bang. Quick off the start, Ethel Smith of Canada surged ahead, but Betty easily overcame her. 
Only Bobby Rosenfeld lay ahead, but Betty punched her arms up and down. Step by step, she came along, alongside Bobby, and the two ran together, stride for stride. But Betty pumped her arms faster and faster to increase the turnover of each step. She inched ahead. She could have been racing alone because everyone dropped away. The crowd, Bobby, Ethel, everyone. She may have been flying. Not once did she feel the surface of the track under her whirring feet. Her mind was quiet. Every gear in her body turned easily. Nothing else mattered. The white finish tape got closer and closer and she threw out her chest and reached her arms upward, hurling herself into the tape with everything she had. As it caught on her chest and she crossed the finish line, she closed her eyes and lifted her face upward toward the sky. She had done it. But wait, had she? I love that. Um, it just so captured me right from the beginning and I, I felt my heart racing um, on Betty's behalf. So you, you really got me on the track with her and also all along the book. Uh -huh. Now we talked about how you people had said to you, why did you do just one? You could, why did you do three? You could have just done one. But why these three particularly? How did you come to these three? Um, right. And first of all, I, I just didn't have any idea about these people at all. And I'm going to be I'm gonna take a wild guess that most people um, didn't know either. And the only reason that I had heard of Tidy, whom we meet later in the book, who is friendly with Louise, is because of a documentary I saw just two years ago, which is done by Deborah uh, Riley Draper called Olympic Pride and American Prejudice. And so that is the only reason that I knew. <laughs> but tell me how you came to these three. <laughs> well, I didn't know any of these athletes either. I'm embarrassed to admit that. I think they should all be household names. Um, my youngest daughter is a swimmer. And so a few years ago, she needed to pick a American to do a biography project on. And she picked Gertrude Ederly, who was completely a name I had never heard of. Ederly was an Olympian from 1924, a swimmer who won three medals in Paris. She then went on to become the first woman to swim the English Channel. And she comes home feted as a real celebrity. President Woodrow Wilson called her America's best girl. She came home to a ticker tape parade, yet I had never heard of her. And so it was my daughter's project that prompted me to start thinking about women athletes. Because I think that sports, we're all drawn, I think, often to sports stories, even if we know nothing about the sports it's written about, because they provide that mirror of kind of what's happening to, you know, in society. And so I started digging around and quite honestly, I still play USTA League tennis. I was interested in finding a tennis story, but I think it was Betty who I found first. And I ran track in high school. I've been a runner my whole life, run the Boston Marathon. I knew this world of running. And so I was just fascinated. And Betty, I loved her story in that she starts as this golden girl and then, and this is on the back of the book, so I don't think this is a big spoiler, but she's in a plane crash and, and she's left for dead. She, she's thrown into the back of a truck, arrives at the undertakers, and it's not until he sees her chest moving that he notifies the doctors and doctors tell her she'll be lucky to ever walk again, much less run. Well, she does. She was a woman who would not take no for an answer. And she has this amazing comeback story that I couldn't believe I had never heard of before. So right then and there, I knew I had a character that I wanted to explore more. And then I found Helen, who is such a different story from Betty because Helen really is such an underdog. For so long, she's an outcast in her community. And it's not until she experiences some success running that really her life transforms. So I liked the juxtaposition of these two really different um, trajectories into the Olympics. And then Louise is the Olympian who I think history has erased. I mean, she qualifies in 32 and 36 and has such a, a, a nonstop series of obstacles she must overcome. And as a woman of color, she, her experience is very different from, from Betty and Helen's. So I felt that the three give us a real sense of, of a lot of different challenges women were facing during this period, even sports aside. But sports kind of upped the tension on really everything these women were trying to achieve. So, so I knew that these were my three. And, and Tidy was right there too, and she ends up in the story as because of her good friendship with Louise. And there are a lot of other, I mean, this is a real story about sisterhood too, I feel like. This was a group of women who, who meet during these various Olympics. Some of them reappear throughout 28, 32, and 36. And, you know, real lifelong friendships are formed. 
Um, one of the things that um, I have to remind myself as I'm reading your book um, is that this is a historical novel, so that you have taken some liberties in telling their stories, but you have so much fodder, so much real history upon which to write their stories. And the time in which all of this is happening was, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't make this drama up. You know, there's the Nazi regime, the 36 Olympics, the politicization, all of the stuff that um, has echoes today. Um, how Louise is, is tr Louise and Tidy and the other uh, African American athletes were treated, and and their whole should I be quiet or should I say something? All of that um, is 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 as, as though it were today. Talk to me about what, how you decided what would be imagined because you have a lot of quite um, good detail, which I know comes from actual documents. Right. So. That's such a good question. I mean, this was often the real struggle with this book because there are so many interesting details. And this was one of those books I often had to set a timer during my research. And if I didn't turn something up that had a direct link to the story, I had to move on because there were so many rabbit holes I could have traveled down and spent days pursuing. Um, so Helen and Betty, their lives are actually fairly well documented for the times, and, and I should just say for a woman, a regular woman athlete. I mean, this is very different from if they had been like a queen or something. Well-documented is, is still sort of, there's still a lot of room for imagination. But these women both have a biography written on them, and there are several nonfiction books about them, and there are lots of newspaper articles, and you can, you can find Betty and Helen on the internet. It's Louise who there is definitely a lot less about. And so there were some basic kind of biographical points of her life I knew about. And then I had to start kind of really using my imagination to fill in the blanks. And, and so, for example, one thing that I really struggled to understand was why she comes back again for 36. 32 leads to such disappointment for her. What was it about her life that was going to motivate her to come back and try it again? And so I was casting my net research-wise quite widely and was doing some research into what Malden was like, for example, during that period. And that's when I found some really interesting stories about um, specifically World War I veterans in Malden. And, and there was a story right at the beginning of when I was starting to dig around in 2017 about historians um, realizing that their World War I monument was incomplete. It was only about 550 names really only the Irish Americans in that community and, and women, uh, black veterans, veterans of different groups like the Italian, they were all left off. And so this idea of veterans like coming home from this war and not being recognized for their efforts, I could see a parallel and a way to kind of understand what, what fueled Louise. And this idea of serving country and wanting to do better for your country, even though that idea wasn't necessarily being reciprocated from your countrymen. That, that idea of veterans, I could see that connection. And so, so I was able, for example, to create a fictional uncle for Louise, who's, who's one of these World War I veterans and, and has this relationship with her where he's, he's really urging her along because he knows what it feels like to work towards something, to not be recognized for it, but to still believe in it. So, you know, again, it's, it was a lot of imagining the smaller moments, kind of the connective tissue of this story, because the big moments are actually totally real. I mean, the, play, the sort of the craziest things about the story are the things I didn't have to make up at all. The plane crash, the encounters with Hitler in, in, in Berlin. A lot of the big historical moments are out there and can be read about from a lot of different perspectives. I really needed to use my imagination to figure out who these women were and kind of what was their family life like and, and what were the quieter moments of their life like. I needed to understand those to try to bring them to life. Well, one of the things that I, I intuitively knew about uh, Louise would be that there would be a lot of pressure on her that you might not see that to be a credit to her race. So that would be motivational too in that, in that time period. And also, um, when, when you were doing the stories about their being on the trains, the one thing I would have urged you to put in there that the, the Pullman car porters were always black. 
and they would have been quite solicitous of Louise and Tidy. And whereas every place else they went, of course, they were discriminated against about where they could live. So that was interesting to me. But let's, you have some pictures of them. And I'd love for people to see the real pictures of, of Helen and of Betty and of Louise um, and that Malden monument that you have. Yes. So this, oops, here, I'll go back. This is a really well-known, I mean, you can find this easily on the internet, this photo of Helen with Hitler. Um, he wants to meet her when she comes to Berlin. He considered her such a fine specimen of, of Aryan womanhood. He, he had this private meeting with her, which ends up being, well, I guess people have read the book. It ends up being yeah. very strange. And that's actually a very true part of the book. Helen's biographer kind of helped me better understand that moment. I was able to travel to Missouri, read Helen's um, handwritten diary from Berlin and, and read about these strange encounters. Um, we have Betty there on the wow. left. That's a photo of her from the 1928 games. She's even signed it. You can see her autograph there. And there's a She's young- tiny. I know, <laughs> she, was. she was. Whereas Helen's six feet tall, Betty was the opposite. And there's a photo of her, a really young Betty um, in 1928. And um, this is a photo that's really special, I think. It's one of the few photos out there of Louise. Again, a quick Google image search will show you, will show you there are only about three images of Louise. You'll see her down there on the left-hand corner. This is a photo from a local family here in West Seattle, where I live. Um, their grandmother was on this Olympic wow. team. I know, amazing. And so they have these amazing scrapbooks and, and all of Grandma Gertie's old, memorabilia and this was one and so i was i just couldn't believe it when i found this photo of louise i was wow. thrilled so this is when they've all returned home in 36 after the games they're in new york city um then this is a photo from two photos from malden i was able to find the railroad tracks where louise trained um wow. it was opening scenes with her on the tracks that's now basically a parking lot for a strip mall in malden <laughs> yeah. um and those are the monuments there on the right that the center one is the original one and then historians were able to find as i said 1500 other names and so i think this is so interesting given that monuments have been a big part of the news lately malden decided to expand their understanding of their World War I veterans, and they built those two additional monuments to flank the original with all the, uh, all the extra names. Wow. And then the final one I have here is Helen and Jesse Owens. So um, they were teammates. Helen was very impressed. Of course, Jesse Owens is very well known as sort of the king of these Olympics with his four gold medals. So um, everyone was totally obsessed with, with Jesse at this games. In fact, Berliners were widely known for sort of chanting his name, um, throwing flowers at him, inviting him over to their apartments for lunch. He had a remarkable Olympic experience. Yes, he did. And of course, he uh, defied Hitler because he um, proved that it wasn't the Aryan race that could be right. excellent by winning right. the gold medals that he did. All right. Well, um, we're just about at uh, the point where people like to talk about the end of the book. So I want to give a spoiler uh, warning. And we have a poll question so that we can find out how many of you um, have finished the book. So the second poll is coming up to get your response to that before we plunge forward. Have you finished reading Fast Girls by Elise Hooper? This is the poll. We're going to see what you answer. I think we're calculating. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's see. Okay. No, I do not mind spoiler. No, yes, I finished reading most people. I don't mind spoilers. No, please try to best to warn me. Okay, so for the 7% of you, I'm warning you, this is a spoiler. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, tell us why you decided to close out with uh, bringing um, all the details of what happened to them. Yeah. So, you know, often, I know where I'm starting in a novel and I know where I'm ending. And this was one, I knew where I was ending this book from the moment I started. Those 19, the, the final relay in 1936 on August 9th, that felt like an important moment um, in our country's history. It's sort of that larger theme of fighting against um, the, the Nazis. And it also, I loved the teamsmanship of it, the, all these women to coming together versus some of the individual races. 
But I'll also say this, of course, is very complicated because of Louise. I mean, if I was just writing about Betty and Helen, that final scene would have been really easy to write. Instead, with Louise in the mix, there are a lot there are a lot of feelings there. And so I think if I were to go back and look at, I rewrote that chapter so many times, various beta readers, friends of mine reading it, giving me feedback, because I really wanted to strike that note between victory and there is a lot of unfinished business at the end there. And I wanted to, to allude to that um, on no uncertain terms. So. So the end is tricky. I mean, it was tricky for me as a as a writer, and I think a lot of readers come away with kind of a variety of feelings um, from being really frustrated in a lot of ways by what happens to Louise. I tidy fortunately gets to race. She gets her moment, but Louise doesn't. And and I've wondered, you know, if the Olympics hadn't been canceled in 1940 because of World War II, and then 44. I mean, would Louise have done it again? I don't know. It's, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I think Helen certainly was just getting started. She'd be, I think, a much more well-known athlete if we had had two more Olympics for, for her to really prove herself. I, I think there's, there's a case to be made that Louise would have done it again, too. Um, so there's a bit of unfinished history there that I think is kind of fascinating. Okay, well, we're going to audience questions okay. in just a moment. I want everybody to get ready to ask those questions if you're not already doing it. But before that, I want to introduce the team behind tonight's event. They're managing the technology, connecting with you. You can't see them. Jen Gilchrist is our event producer overseeing the whole virtual production. Jen, come on and say hello. Jen? Oh, Jen. Jen, we, we can't hear you. All right, let me skip over to Suzanne. <laughs> Suzanne is keeping an eye on our Q&A question box. Suzanne, come on and say hello. You're muted. <laughs> So, hi everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, keep those questions coming and definitely let us know where you're tuning in from. So we'd love to hear from you. All right. Um, Jen, are you all set or should I go right ahead? Maybe we'll circle back to Jen so that you can make. Jen, can you say hello? You're mid, you're mute. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, all right. Well, thanks, Jen and Suzanne. Now let's hear from Jamie Reese. She's senior, senior manager of local development and member engagement about how you can continue to support GBH's efforts, not only beyond the virtual events we continue to provide. Jamie, welcome. Mm -hmm. Hello, thank you. And hi, everyone. Thanks so much for spending some time with us tonight during our Beyond the Page event. You know, the great thing about books and WG, oh, I mean GBH, is the fact that both are commercial free. GBH is commercial free and member supported, and that means we're here because you want us here. Our commercial free status also means we count on your support. If you're able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member, you will receive an autographed copy of next month's Beyond the Page book selection titled How to Educate a Citizen. And we would be happy to send that to you as a token of our appreciation. As we navigate this ever-changing reality, financial support from our donors is what keeps us strong and we'd really appreciate your support. So please give $5 a month or $60 at once, whatever works for you. It's so easy. All you need to do is go to gbh.org slash support events. Click on that link and contribute what you can. Uh, so again, please give $5 a month or $60 all at once, whatever works for you. It's so easy, you should have a link um, on the screen, it says gbh.org slash support events and just contribute what you can. Thanks again for joining us. And now I hand it over back to you, Callie. Thanks, Jamie. Um, it's time for your questions. I know you've been waiting. Remember to use the Q&A function and we've got a bunch of them already. Here's one that everybody voted up by Jody Zalk. I'm a native Maldonian and I read the book because I've always heard about Louise Stokes, but didn't know much about her. 
I was really sad to read about her experience at Malden High. Was any of that true? And wanted to let you know about the serendipity and timing with tonight's event. A local online newspaper just printed this story about a local bike path running route just dedicated to her. And she has a, um, a link here for you to have uh, uh, Elise. Isn't that interesting? That is, I've heard rumors of this. And actually, sometimes when I've done events in New, online, of course, with New Englanders, I say, if anyone knows of this rumor, can confirm it, please let me know. So thank you. Jo that was Jody, right? That's yes. Jody. So exciting. I will check that out after this. Um, as far as her experience at Malden High School, and, and I should also point out, there is a statue of her there in the courtyard at Malden High School. And I went one Sunday afternoon when I was in Malden last <laughs> June of 2019, and I wasn't thinking ahead that, of course, the courtyard was gated off on a Sunday. So I didn't get right up close to it, but I could see it from afar. Um, I know that Louise dropped out of high school during that senior year. So she came within a few months of graduation and stopped. And so that also was very intriguing to me, what had happened. And I had some theories as to what happened. I mean, I suspect that over the years, she was constantly, um, both overtly and probably subtly, encouraged not to complete this from her teachers and classmates. So, and of course, also this was the 30s, so there was a lot of financial pressure on families. So I wove all that in together to kind of create the um, pressure she would have felt to want to help support her family. And also um, the encounter with the teacher, I, I, that was from my imagination, but I didn't think it, I th think it could have very well been the kind of thing she would have experienced. So, okay, it is disappointing. I Here's one from Deborah Barron. Tell us about Babe Diedrichson. I knew about her, but was surprised about her attitude towards the others. Right. I'm always asked about Babe. Um, you know, Babe is a really interesting figure. And I think that she was someone who had learned that to get ahead in her world, she decided she was going to look out for herself. Um, she was very competitive and she used that to, to, to her effect of, I mean, I thought it was actually fairly impressive in some cases how she would just announce to the judges she had won a race and they kind of went along with it in some, sometimes, <laughs> usually. Um, and so I think that she had, the reason she did all of that was that was what she had decided worked for her. Whereas a lot of the other women kind of banded together to form a team, Babe had no interest. She was interested in promoting herself. And I think given the historical challenges these women were working with, we can see why perhaps she did that. Maybe we don't agree with it. And of course, her attitudes probably reflected um, the sort of Confederate area of Texas where she grew up. So I think there's a lot there about Babe. But, you know, I would also point out that I'm sure I think she had a lot of insecurities of her own and was trying to figure out a lot of her own life. She does marry a man, but later she'll have an affair with another woman. So I suspect she lived in considerable fear of sort of being discovered in various ways, again, given the time period. So, so I think Babe is one of those really interesting kind of complicated figures who, while her athletic accomplishments were enormous and her contributions to women's athletics were really important, you know, she had a lot personally she was working through. Here's one from Henry Lucas. In 2008, I met Josephine Warren Madden, who was an alternate on the team. She was from Somerville and took the USS Manhattan to Berlin. She did not compete, but was at all the events. Did you come across her name in your research? I did. I have photos of Josephine. Um, you know, there were a lot of women who would make it into these sort of pools and still travel. She was able to raise that $500. And I also want to point out that Boston has a very long storied history with the Olympians, with the Olympics. So there are a lot of Olympians in your area, both men and women. Um, and so that was really exciting to explore. I feel like the Boston area, Missouri, and California also, and Chicago, had a lot of Olympic Olympians all through sort of Olympic history. But um, if you look around your area, I am sure you will find some of them. I know my own past, I was obsessed with the Carruthers, who were some pair skaters, um, the Winter Olympics from, I believe, the 80s. I loved them and wrote them fan mail when I was a kid living in Sudbury, Massachusetts. <laughs> oh, good. Um, all right, this is from Amy Darewimple. Were the newspaper stories in the book actual articles from that time? 
No, and I make a note of that right at the beginning of the book. I did write all of those. I read hundreds of newspaper stories from this period to, to understand the times. And also what just fascinated me was how reporters talked about these women. And so I wanted to write the newspaper articles. First of all, I can't just lift newspaper articles. You know, there are all kinds of copyright issues. So I was creative and kind of wrote my own. Partly, they serve a couple of purposes. They, they certainly serve a narrative purpose of showing you as readers kind of broadly what's happening in society. But I also wanted to show how reporters were talking about women and describing them as buxom or, or sort of relishing their descriptions of cat fights. You know, all these things that the reporters kind of made dramatic. Um, that is all real. I mean, I read hundreds of articles essentially so you don't have to. All of those articles I wrote are essentially what I've joked are kind of like the greatest hits of what I read. Um, and reflect the language and phraseology of the times and certainly the attitude. So, so they were both very fun to write, but also very frustrating because some of those, some of those attitudes and things people were saying, you know, in 2020 feel really insulting at times, but also, I mean, we're not that far away from it. I was very struck by a lot of conversations I remember at the Rio Olympics in 2016 about how women athletes were represented by the media. And so I was really trying to draw the connection there that we've come a long way, but have we really in every regard? I, I would argue the answer to that is no. And I hope the newspaper articles kind of stir that in my readers too. Hmm. Lisa Rimby wants to know, are the scenes written with the athletes, Hitler and Goebbels fictional or were there records of meetings? Yes, no, those were real. Um, the party that takes place, I'll, I'll call it Peacock Island, so I can spare you all my very bad German. Um, that happens after the Olympics. That was actually sort of a closing party to the Olympics. I move it up before, and I make a note of that in my author's note, um, because obviously it sort of builds the drama. And I was just so struck. I mean, I was writing this as all these Me Too stories were emerging of men in their robes greeting, you know, women who show up to work. And um, I, there were a lot of very clear connections to then and now. And I wanted to draw those um, right up to the front. And then of course the encounter between Helen and Hiller is, as I mentioned earlier, real. Hmm. Um, another question from Jody Zalt. I've heard about the history of women being allowed to run in the Boston Marathon. So I was really surprised to read that women were allowed to run in the 1920s, 1930s in this book. Could you share more of this background? Sure. So women, as I said earlier, are allowed to race for the first time in 1928. But um, if you remember from Fast Girls, there is that 800 meter race. And that was a really exciting race by all accounts. Uh, the women, all of them, I believe, the top three finishers all set world records. Um, and many of them, understandably, they had just run half a mile, were tired at the end. And so one even sort of tripped going over the finish because she was trying to push herself ahead of the woman she was running neck and neck with. Well, what happened was that reporters, all these male reporters, were horrified at this idea of seeing what they called wretchedly tired looking women. And so a great outcry went up over this idea of women exerting themselves too hard. And so that 800 race that happens in 1928 is actually the last of its kind, and I, and I mean a distance race there, until really the 60s. The IOC gets rid of anything considered long for a long time. So the first women's marathon in the Olympics doesn't happen until 1984. I think if you're remembering the sort of Catherine Switzer incident from Boston Marathon, I believe that was 1967. The Boston Marathon was a bit ahead of the Olympics. But, but again, there was this idea that women and distance did not go together. People were uncomfortable enough about the idea of women running the idea of them running a great distance was too much for many to handle. But I do want to point out a little historic note here, which is that there was, by all accounts, a woman who ran in the first Olympics in 1896. She ran the marathon um, on her own. She wasn't an official contestant. She had applied but was denied because she was a woman. But she did finish that marathon course. She had witnesses the next day. She did it. And many of the men, the official contestants, hadn't finished. And instead, Stigmata Raviti later boasted that not only had she finished the marathon, but she had stopped a few times to do some shopping. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Sharman <laughs> uh, says, I too am from Malden. Did you find living relatives? Did you try I to didn't. find living relatives? 
I did. I reached out actually to um, the director of the documentary, Pally, that you mentioned earlier, because they interview Louisa's son in that. And I was mm -hmm. trying to figure out a contact to him. I never heard back. Um, I dug around in the internet, never could find him. But I would love to have spoken with that. It, it's just, I think, you know, not everyone, of course, is on the internet these days, so I wasn't able to find him. But I was able to find a number of family members, as I mentioned, um, Helen's official biographer worked with me. Um, but I do know, you know, of the family members I have encountered, everyone is so excited to, that they feel like finally their relative is sort of getting a moment in the sun. It's been really gratifying to connect with people who both had friends and family who raced in these early Olympics. And I'm really grateful to the help and assistance they've given me while working on this book. Uh, Sally Blyberg, what, what was your target audience? Um, anyone who can read, no. Um, I mean, I think, <laughs> I think every author wants anyone to read their book, but I, I mean, I was, I'm hopeful that anyone who's interested in a good story about, um, about really sports, about women's history, uh, I'll cast my net as I, you know, very widely as far as who is my target audience. I'm just always interested in connecting with people who want to hear a good interesting story that maybe they had really never thought about you know most people when i told them i was working on a book about uh women olympians from the 1920s and 30s i tended to get kind of blank stares and people would say oh i didn't i didn't realize women were in the olympics back then but then when i would sort of ask them out of just my own curiosity when do you think they started racing <laughs> sort of no one really knows so i really felt like i was onto something here because People were intrigued. We, we know so much about like the boys in the boat or Louis mm -hmm. Zamperini of Unbroken. It felt like this was a great time to try to bring up some women from this period and, and get to know their stories. Hmm. Anissa, who, what inspired you to start your writing journey? Oh, well, okay. So this is another local thing to the Boston area. So I grew up, as I said, both in Weston and Sudbury. And I went to Orchard House many times as a kid. Orchard House being Louisa May Alcott's home in Concord, Massachusetts. I went to drama camp there. And I remember going up to that little bedroom up on that second floor and seeing the tiny desk where Louisa wrote Little Women. And that, I was probably about nine or 10, that's when I realized that people write books. They don't just magically appear on bookshelves. We write them. <laughs> and so that was really the beginning to me where I thought to myself, I was an avid reader. I could write a book someday. And, and so really I credit Louisa May Alcott as kind of being the beginning of all this. And of course she is the subject of, of my first novel. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, Lynn Levy, I recently read an article about a remarkable surfer, a, wo a woman who surfed the largest wave in Portugal. The gist of the article was that she barely noticed, she was barely noticed even though she made history. Can you talk about the slow progress for women? I mean, you know, it's an interesting tension because I can go out and cheer on my daughters competing and they don't even really know they're doing anything different. Like they just take it for granted that they're out there competing in sports. And yet we have come a long way. With that said, I mean, just considering that, you know, as early as 1928, women weren't, were just finally being allowed to try to run a hundred meters. Um, over the years, women have been able to compete in an increasingly wide range of sports. Um, I will point out the Olympics still does not have an equal number of events open to men and women. And I think the IOC has not reached their target that they'd like to have for women executives on their board. So there is a lot of progress to be made. I mean, we've seen that with the women's soccer team uh, demanding pay parity. Um, we, there are opportunities for pay, for sponsorship, for representation in the media, for coaching. Uh, I think we still have a lot of areas where we can see progress for women athletes. And I really hope that these Olympics that were postponed this summer, you know, Tokyo 2020, mm -hmm. I hope they happen next summer because I think that American athletes, especially these women are enjoying such successes. And I think that momentum and the public um, attention that they get during the Olympics will really help to move the conversation and progress hopefully along because there are still a lot of areas where we need to see um, more more equality and equity between the 
between the sexes, between races, everything. Hmm. Sheila Fair, did you pick the 36 Olympics because of these women or did you start with the Hitler factor of 36 and then found these women? No, I found the women first, to be honest. And so I really started with 1928. And there is this interesting then sort of very discreet period of women's track and field history, which is 1928, 1932, and 1936, because then the next two Olympics are canceled because of the world of World War II. And so those three Olympics kind of provide a really interesting view into that period. It, it's often kind of the same women who are circulating around those Olympics, um, competing in one or two or three of them. I'm trying to think of anyone competed in all three. Um, but, but so it was more of that, that period, those women drew me to it. But then, I mean, of course, those 1936 games are so dramatic in their own right. They really kind of ratchet up the tension and drama to, I think, create an exciting ending. Mm -hmm. and, uh, no, uh, Denise Legault, where in Malden is Louisa's plaque located? So the, um, the, the statue that has been dedicated to her is right in the courtyard at Malden High School. And then uh, the different thing, which is the veterans plaque, um, that is in a park that is going, that has slipped my mind what its, what its current name is. I'm sure maybe someone from Malden there might know it off the top of their heads. But, but so the, the, um, that park is in a different part of town, but, but her statue is at the high school. Okay, and uh, Anne Rivens, I didn't read the book, but now I will. How, how did the women train for the Olympics? And what were some obstacles in their training? Boy, was there obstacles as you <laughs> outlined. There really were. Yeah. I, yeah. I have to tell you, I mean, so training was so different back then than it is now. I follow all these athletes on Instagram and social media now. And I mean, boy, I get, I get just tired looking at their feeds, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not going to lie, women, like, they were smoking and drinking back then. I mean, the boat to Berlin, they're all eating ice cream and overindulging in dessert. Um, it was not the state of the art necessarily that you see today. With that said, I think the biggest obstacle these early women Olympians encountered was simply the opportunity to get out there. And we see it I, with Helen, especially. I mean, she is invited to start running with her, the boys track team at her high school to train, but very quickly parents are unhappy because she's beating the boys and they think that that's very unnatural. And so there was just this idea of women running being very unnatural, number one. And number two, if they were good enough and beating the boys, that too was frowned upon. So, so there were these very, you know, societal pressure on these women. Women. And then just, I have some pictures, for example, of like Helen's wool tracksuit. Really, try to imagine running these days in an all wool tracksuit. We're so spoiled with our comfortable shoes and performance fabrics. None of that existed back then. That's right. Um, Susan, can't quite read the last name. Not a question, but a remark. I am surprised at how much I love this book. Your writing is beautiful and sensitive. I'm inspired by the indomitable spirit of your characters and hope that I can draw upon their tenacity and spirit as I navigate these difficult times. Uh, next one, Anonymous, what project are you working on now? So I'm working on a book now, uh, and, and you know, right now, kind of trapped at home, I, I'm really working my tail off because there's really not a whole lot else for me to do. <laughs> um, so I am currently working on a book that is set in World War II. It's inspired my, by my grandfather's service. He was in the Pacific Theater, and here I am in Seattle. I felt like the Pacific Theater maybe hasn't gotten enough attention recently. A lot of recent World War II novels have been set in Europe, so I wanted to take advantage of my own family history and kind of where I live in the world and look westward. And I found this um, amazing story of what was happening to these U.S. Army nurses in the Philippines during World War II. Many of them um, are in Manila, um, really as kind of farm girls who've been offered this opportunity to live kind of a high life there in the, what was called the Pearl of the Orient at the time, um, pre-World War One, uh, World War II Manila, and then the World War starts, and these women are patching men up on the front lines. They're really serving with bullets whizzing by, bombs dropping on them for about six months until they are taken as prisoners of war, and then it's just a remarkable story of, of hope and 
per perseverance. These women all survive three years in a POW camp. And not only are there these nurses inside the camp, but there's a really interesting um, collection of women outside the camp, Filipina, American, who are supporting these women and trying to um, support both the men and women in the camp. But so it's, a, it's an exciting story and one I knew nothing about. And the craziest part of all this is that I was able to go to the Philippines in February, right before everything shut down. So I came home, the world started closing down. I was here in Seattle and I had this trip fresh in my mind. And so I have been writing furiously ever since. So hopefully that story will be coming to you sometime soon. Um, Henry again wants to know, did you include anything about the 1936 trip to Berlin on the ship? I understand the women were not given the best accommodations, but they did like to watch the wrestlers practice on the upper deck. <laughs> um, I, I do cover the journey on the ship. And, you know, I think there was a lot of people watching across the board, men and women. You had all these young fit people together. You can only imagine, I'm sure, some of the excitement that followed. Uh, there, when I was reading people's diaries, listening to their oral histories, there were a lot of accounts of like, there were casino nights and um, fake weddings. That was kind of a big thing on cruises at that time. And so, yes, the, the athletes definitely amused themselves on the journey in 28 uh, and 36 too. I have two more questions for you. One, what surprised you uh, in your research? Well, there were so many surprises, honestly. Uh, this book was nothing but surprise after surprise. I would say that I think an underreported aspect of the story is um, we all know of Jesse Owens and his remarkable accomplishments in Berlin, but there were 17 other black athletes that traveled to Berlin. Um, it was an American team of about 360, but so a really small group, only 18 black athletes. Those that small group won 25% of the medals in Berlin. And yet, really, it's only Jesse we know about. Uh, American newspaper men were not eager to report on the successes of many of these African-American athletes. And so many of their stories really have, as I said, not really been nearly as well known as Jesse's. And so these were men who came home, men and women who came home and um, couldn't compete in their collegiate races because of Jim Crow laws. Um, Jesse Owen was never allowed to live on campus at Ohio State because of the color of his skin. These athletes felt enormous pressure, not only to disprove Hitler's theories, but to also prove themselves to their own countrymen. So I thought that was fascinating. I, I had no idea of um, such a successful cohort was there, and yet we know so little about them. Um, and in the documentary that I referenced, uh, she does tell their stories. Um, one last question for me in that, do you think that today's track and field athletes, certainly the ones who are Olympians, have any idea about these stories? I've heard people like Serena reference people in the past, you know, in tennis or whatever, but I wonder if they know these stories. Yeah. I would love to ask some of them, quite honestly. Yeah. I don't know. I think, um, I will say that Betty, Helen, and Louise, and Titan, none of them are in the Olympic Hall of Fame, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, I think the Tiger Bells and some of the track athletes we know who come later, Wilma Rudolph, for example, I think probably Serena and um, Simone Biles and some of these athletes we love today, I think Allison Felix, they do know of some of them, but not certainly all of them. And, you know, there is just, I could have included, I mean, I could have just written this book forever. There are so many great <laughs> stories, honestly. So I think um, digging around in some of these wonderful oral histories and um, nonfiction books that are out there, I highly encourage readers to do it. There are just... I, Really, wherever you live in this country, if you if you search around, I'm sure there are some interesting stories that are um, right underneath your noses about early athletes. It's pretty amazing. It sure is. Margot Coletti wants to know, I was fascinated by the nightclub with the pneumatic tubes used to communicate between tables. Was that a thing in Europe in the 30s? I don't know if that was a real thing across the continent, but I saw, I mean, Berlin was considered really sort of state of the art nightlife at this time. And, and it was really trying to put its best foot forward to the world, obviously. Um, I saw, I've seen pictures of it and just descriptions of that club were, were just sort of mind boggling. It, it sounded really fun. Um, and so I thought the idea, I mean, of course I had to work that into the book because it's just such a 
kind of one of these wonderful moments of kind of historic detail that I felt like had to be included. But the idea of kind of writing notes and watching them zip away and even phones on each table, I thought that was a yeah. lot of fun. <laughs> and it felt very futuristic as well. <laughs> yeah. Yes. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in for this month's Beyond the Page Book Club. And a special thanks to you, Elise Hooper, for your wonderful book. So interesting, so much history, and beautifully written. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you. Thank you all so much for reading it. Or if you haven't read it, you're now planning to. I'm, I'm so grateful. And Callie, thank you. It's been such a pleasure to meet you and the whole just GBH team. All of you have been amazing. And I really appreciate it's, it's a challenging time to be an author, and I yes. just appreciate the support. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, you're quite welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Join us over the coming weeks as we take a dive into our October selection, a nonfiction book entitled How to Educate a Citizen by esteemed author E.D. Hirsch, Jr., Senior investigative reporter Philip Martin will lead the discussion. The virtual conversation will take place on Thursday, October 22nd at 7 p.m. You can register for this event at gbh.org events. Don't forget to also join our Beyond the Page Facebook group for even more discussion topics as you read the novel. And now another quick message from Jamie on how you can show your support. Jamie. Hi again, everyone. We really hope you enjoyed tonight's event with Callie and Elise. And as I mentioned before, the great thing about books and GBH is the fact both are commercial free. And our commercial free status at GBH means we rely on your support now more than ever. If you're able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member or $60 all at once, we will send you an autographed copy of next month's Beyond the Page book selection, How to Educate a Citizen as a thank you gift. It's so easy to donate. Please go to gbh.org slash support events, click on that link and contribute what you can. Thanks for doing your part to make a contribution to programming you not only enjoy, but programming and stories you believe in. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great evening. We look forward to connecting with you again, and we hope you and your family are staying healthy, both physically and emotionally during this time. Stay safe.